Hello everyone, my name is Kate Kratzen and I'm the curator at the David Winton Bell Gallery here at Brown. Before introducing Elizabeth Subrin, I'd like to thank the many people at the Brown Arts Initiative who have worked on this screening and conversation, specifically Sean Tavares and Greg Picard, who are orchestrating the tech, including this Zoom session. Elizabeth Subrin is a Brooklyn-based filmmaker, visual artist, and associate professor of film and media at Temple University. Her critically acclaimed feature narrative, A Woman Apart, was released theatrically in 2017. Her critically acclaimed short films and installations have screened and exhibited widely in film festivals, museums, and galleries. A 2020 Fulbright Fellow, she's currently working on a film and book project about the late French actress Maria Schneider in light of the global Me Too movement. Subrin has taught at Harvard University, Yale University School of Art, Cooper Union, Amherst College, Bennington College, and the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Now, Elizabeth, I want to contextualize our relationship for viewers who may be unaware of how curators actually develop relationships with artists over the years. Um, you describe yourself as a filmmaker trained in art schools, but the first time I encountered your work in a white cube was at Sue Scott Gallery. So I first saw your work in a gallery rather than a film festival. And that was in 2010. And I was with Stamatina Gregory, who is now chief curator at Leslie Lohman Museum. And she suggested we do a studio visit with you. And then over the years, we kept in touch. Uh, it was easy because you were commuting to Temple in Philadelphia. And in 2013, I invited you to collaborate on a project for the Institute of Contemporary Arts 50th anniversary exhibition which was a series of small projects that responded directly to historic ICA exhibitions. Having seen The Fancy, your 2000 film on Francesca Woodman, I suspected you would be interested in the archives from her 1989 exhibition at ICA, and you were. And uh, can you can describe the, the ultimate project that we developed together, Damage Report, and the direction that that took? Well, it, it was a really exciting project in the sense that it ultimately became the first time I had ever made an, ex uh, well, since art school, a work of art that completely didn't have any moving image in it, but it did end up having sound in it almost unintentionally through the projection of the film in another room. But anyway, Kate helped me get into the archives at Penn so that I was able to look at the original documentation of the photographer Francesca Woodman's um, archives and of the exhibition. And what was interesting about it is having made a film about her, I really, in a way was like, Kate, I don't think I have anything else to say about her. And I was a little stumped at first, but Kate was really pushing me um, to, to stick with um, Francesca Woodman as the subject. And it was amazing because we went to the archives together. And I guess this is all about what a curatorial practice, can, how it can become a collaboration between an artist and a curator. And as we were looking at what is now called the condition reports, which are reports that the registrar makes of a work of art as it enters the museum and then as it leaves it, to document any damage to it um, as a preparator to make sure that the work has not been damaged during the time that it's in a new institution. And what was amazing about the original registrar's descriptions of Woodman's work, I was like, these read like exquisite little haikus that reflect both the language of Francesca Woodman's own titles, but also kind of describe her work in general. They were very haunting. And what I can do right now, Kate, if, if this makes sense, is to actually show the installation of the work. So I'm going to pull this together and open it, and then I will screen share. Um, Okay, going back to Zoom, screen share, here we are. Okay, so let's view this, um, whoops, enter full screen. Okay, so the ultimate installation that I made looked like this in the ICA. So it's basically pedestals, vitrines, and 
these vitrines that when you first walk into the exhibition space, you feel like there's nothing there. You can't really see any markings. But as you get closer to it, you see that there is language on them, like this smell, uh, what does this say? I almost forget it. Small loss. Uh, long spine. Is, a long spine. Um, wait, let's go. Or no change or, come on, whoops, sorry. Are there any more? Oh yeah, so that one said small losses along spine. So if any of you are familiar with her work, you know that this was a young artist who was very obsessed with the past and with uh, representations of her own body. And in my mind, a lot of the work was really about her inability to speak. And she kept speaking about her invisibility. They're really exquisite photos. And in many ways, what the registrar described evoked Francesca Woodman's disappearance. And so what I was interested in is how we, we represent the absence of an artist or how we represent an artist after they're gone. And what does it mean? Like what is a full work of art? Is the work of art just the completed work or is it the damage to a work? Like once a work is damaged, is it still the work of art or what is the relationship between a historical record of a work of art and the work or the relationship between, of course, the question of the work of art versus the subject. So what we did is we created these glass vitrines very much like what you would see in a museum to preserve a precious object. And we used the original registrar's text and had them etched into these vitrines so that all you see in each vitrine is a documentation of the damage. And uh, what was interesting about installing it with Kate is that once we put it in there with the amazing cement floors and the lighting, it really felt like a mausoleum and almost the whole thing became a representation of absence just like hers did. is And in terms of the idea of the conversation today, which is about recreation, what was really also amazing is that through a phone book, essentially, or the internet, we were able to find the registrar so that she could actually part to come to the opening and also give me her blessing to reproduce her language. And um, so that, that was exciting to have that kind of recreation, but also a relationship to the real through the registrar. So that's damage report. Right, and it absolutely is in line with your interest in um, in women artists and women figures uh, in terms of presence and absence because Francesca Woodman's suicide framed her work in a way that you were critiquing in your 2000 film, The Fancy, as well as in this exhibition. What does that exhibition mean when you know that Francesca Woodman took her own life at such a young age versus encountering those objects without that information? Um, it's something that I would have liked to have more conversations with with viewers, but uh, perhaps in the future when we, we reinstall it again. Yeah, and I think that also just in this question of the history of women's art in general, or what art, like what percentage of work by women artists historically are we actually seeing given the historical role of women? And so that in a certain way, the historical record of women's art, if we go back to, for, for example, the you know great classic essay, why are there no great women artists is where are these artists? And when they're gone also, what is left of them? Like how many of them enter the canon? How many of them are seen? And then, as you said about suicide, you know, was the nature of her absence part of what has now made her work be seen? Right. And that was your first, as you said, work that did not have a moving image in it. However, my initial hope had been to work with you on a film at some point. We know that that budget, those IC50 budgets did not allow an actual film project. 
Um, but in all fairness, it was also not enough time. For not me. enough time, <laughs> yeah. of course. Of course. Um, and, but here we are six years later, and you have the multi-stage project Maria Schneider in 1983, which you have mentioned over the last few years to me, and it's finally in production. Uh, but we should first address Shuli, which many of our viewers just watched. Um, though Shuli was made over 20 years ago, your practice still focuses on what you have defined as speculative biographies, that is, conceptual portraits of women subjects that examine the complexities of representation. Uh, can you elaborate on that term? Because I love that you framed your work so early in your career around speculative biographies. Well, I think that what I was thinking about a lot, even prior to Shuli in a film I made about uh, called Swallow, which we may have to table because there's too much to talk about, but is the again the relationship between the dominant or official historical record and um, the absences in women's history and by women that's with a in quote um, around that word women and also um, how history is positioned and not just in terms of women but in general I mean there's the cliche that history is written by the winners but it's also history is written and how that writing and how that language positions a subject is of course very subjective but that is often not acknowledged and so when someone writes a biography or researches or positions an individual subject, often the subjectivity of the author representing a historical, again, subject is uh, manipulative and controlled and um, has a very specific position. And so I think particularly because, you know, I was educated in the 90s when we were talking a lot about relationships between what we called race, class, and gender, and what we were thinking in kind of French feminist theory about ideas about language, especially because of French, but the kind of slices in language and the creases and the absences, my impulse was to go exactly to those places. So the reason I call it speculative is almost in a way, it's almost apologetic because what I'm saying is I'm going to go look at the parts of history that haven't existed, A, and when they're absent or when they've been told another way, I'm going to insert into the biography what I speculate was absent. So that's what I mean by that. And the reason I just said it was apologetic is because I think so much of history is fictional by calling it speculative, it's still kind of implying that there is uh, an uh, authoritative representation. And so, but that's, one could argue that uh, conceptual biography or a biography about, that represents erasures is, should be as dominant as anything else. And you deploy recreation, um, and I'd love to hear how you define that as a strategy to do this in your work. Yes, I do. And, and, you know, when we had a conversation about it last week, Kate, I was so articulate. I don't know if I'm going to be able to duplicate that um, precision. But I guess the way I can frame it is how recreation is generally used. And then I'll bounce off that. But generally, especially in cinema, recreation and in documentary, recreation is used to represent historical events that haven't been seen. Because as we all know, a whole documentary about talking heads, unless you're like Claude Lonsman, um, is not really compelling. I, to give you an example, someone who did this kind of early, oh my God, now I'm blocking on his name, the thin, uh, thin blue line. line. Um, I am blocking on that man's Errol, name. Errol Morris? Errol Morris, thank you. He was really kind of somebody, especially because of, of he was he is an amazing documentarian, but he also paid for his documentaries through commercial directing and advertisements. So he started doing recreations in his documentary that were very, very slick reproductions. But the reproductions 
were really to kind of literalize or concretize uh, to produce evidence really of events that hadn't been recorded. So even though they are speculative in the fact that they're remaking a moment that didn't exist uh, on film, they are trying to faithfully reproduce that. Whereas, which, I, I, yes, it's a tool and it needs to be, it, it will make a film way more interesting to visualize these unrecorded events. But what I was more interested in is reproducing events to point to how they weren't ever represented um, accurately to begin with, or how the representation, if I can reposition a representation, even quote unquote inaccurately or speculatively rather than faithfully, I can point to other ideas in the work. And I mean, there are a lot of tactics. And as we talk about different works, I can talk about the unique tactics in each one, but in a broad stroke, speculation rather than faithful is, is to kind of privilege ideas over a, a kind of facsimile or a, a literal representation. And surely remains a significant work because it was not just because, for many reasons, but it was groundbreaking at the time in its shot-by-shot -shot recreation method. And you said before that there were sneaky signifiers um, in the film that I missed every time I've watched. A Starbucks, I heard a Starbucks cup at some There's point. A Starbucks uh, cup in there. I remember first encountering it and not knowing if it was archival footage or it just, especially the scene of, the scenes with, um, at the time, what you would say was hippies in the park. It looked so of the 90s that Samatina and I remember staring at it and trying to figure out together what was archival and what was recreation. Um, but what was your intention with that film at the time? And can you speak about the film's continued influence in that shot by shot? And of course, I want you to talk about Psycho as, uh, as a film that came yeah, out. That story. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the way that Shuli happened was that for a film I made before that called Swallow, which was basically looking at um, kind of 80s teenage experience, especially focused on a little girl who was anorexic as a very young girl in the 80s, um, and looking at it against the backdrop of the legacy of 70s feminism and the women's liberation movement, I was interested in that film, which also had recreations in this question of like, if girls growing up in the 80s had inherited kind of the legacy and the privilege and the benefits of the women's rights movement, why were, you know, why essentially did they have their heads in toilets and in the 80s? So in doing that, I had to find a lot of archival footage of uh, the feminist movement. And so I was, I was looking in different archives, Prelinger's in New York and, and other ones, and there's a great uh, documentary production house in New York, uh, I mean, in Chicago called Kartempkin, who among other things made the film Hoop Dreams. And one of the guys who worked there, who was young was like, look, I don't think I should really show you this, but I wanna slip you this VHS copy of this film that were, we don't show, that came out in 67 called Shuli. And it was a portrait of a young artist at the Art Institute of Chicago, where I had both gone to school for a year as an undergrad, went back there for grad school, and now was teaching there. So that was, you know, across the span of about a decade. And it's her in 1967 talking about her feelings about art, about religion, um, about she was painting and photographing at the time while she was getting her degree. She also talks about men and gender a little bit. There's documentation of her moving through the city, through, I mean, you've, you've uh, presumably just seen it. Um, kind of, there were two scenes that particularly interested me. One was the painting critique scene because that was literally in the Art Institute. And I later found out some of the teachers on the panel in 1967 were still teaching at the Art Institute 30 years later when I was there and saw this footage in 1997. So what really staggered me was that 
what she was saying in 1967 about her life experience and uh, what she went through during this painting critique scene where she was pretty much eviscerated and shut down were things that I could have said in uh, when was I there? I was there as you know a college student in the late 80s. Then I went back there in the 90s for grad school and now I was teaching there and I felt like I could have said that when I was 18. I could have said that when I was uh, 25. I could have said that when I was what, 27? And my students who were 18 could have said everything she said. So what I was thinking about is, okay, and also all the fashion and the aesthetics seem to come full cycle. Her glasses, her kind of mod style, like in the 90s when we were all like riot girls and wearing thrift clothes, we, we were kind of doing the same thing. So I got obsessed with this film. I watched this really crappy VHS copy I'm not even going to explain what VHS is, but like over and over and over. And I kept showing my friends it and I was like, am I crazy or is this incredible? Because everything she seemed to say, I felt like was really while speaking in 67 before the radical feminist movement had really evolved was relevant to right now. So that's number one. The other thing is that I had no idea who Shulamith Firestone was. But I found out that she, two years after she was in this documentary, she went on, and it was a film shot by students at Northwestern. I mean, it's a very aspirational, like grad student kind of form where they were kind of trying to make a documentary while imitating Antonioni. Um, that this young, young woman had gone on to publish what turned out to be and continues to be one of the most important works of American feminist theory, really, that has ever been published. The woman's name was Shulamith Firestone. Here is the book. And she was 25. Uh, she was 25 years old. This is The Dialectic of Sex, A Case for Feminist Revolution. It's still considered an incredibly provocative and incendiary take on gender and feminism in many ways. And I just watching her as a kind of young, aspiring, you know, fumbling, but uh, really striking young woman and knowing that two years later, she wrote this book that rigorously intersected Freudian psychoanalysis, um, uh, Marxist theory, uh, a lot of literature, a lot of philosophy, and which meant she had to, she had to have been starting to write it within the year that she was in this documentary. When I talked to one of the directors of it, who gave me permission to do what I ultimately did, he was just like, "There's just n no way." that that could have happened based on what I knew of her at the time. But in further research I did, I found out that she was actually in a very, very early radical feminist kind of consciousness raising group in 67, 68 called the West Side Group, which is uh, kind of historically documented to be one of the first second wave feminist um, groups from that era. So I became even more obsessed and originally I thought, okay, I'm going to use some of this footage and I'm going to kind of do recreations and then I'll also have historical footage and I, I like was weaving all sorts of ideas and writing proposals for it and in a letter I wrote to um, a producer, I mean, sorry, um, my mentor from my college years, I wrote just what I really want to do is recreate it. And I didn't really know what I meant. I mean, I, I like, I hadn't ever seen like a recreation. I didn't, all I knew is that I wanted to stand where she stood. I wanted to go back to that time period. There were so many things that I felt like I was experiencing in 97 around sexism, around racism, around class that 
didn't feel like they had really changed and were really frustrating me, especially within academia and the way I felt like my professors were handling things that um, I also had a lot of anger. And so all of the other ideas stripped away and I, I started doing research about film stocks and um, cameras and I found a very long story how I found the actress. I literally found her on the street. It turned out that she had been a performance art student at the Art Institute. She looks exactly like Shulamith Firestone. Um, so she never like been in a movie. And let's just remember this was pre cell phones. And so I was like, do you want to do this project? I showed her the film. She said yes. And like two weeks later, she went on a road trip with her boyfriend and literally chopped off all her hair. <laughs> like she had the perfect long, she was surely completely. So that's where the wig came, this like iconic wig. We actually had several wigs. And um, so that's the genesis of it. And what I was interested in is how every single line would land 30 years later. Um, so that it, I really felt like from the privilege of 30 years later, her conversation, which was very prescient, also she talks about this idea of the now, as you saw, it just became this like brilliant commentary on the past. And I knew if I just projected the film, like traveled around the country and was like, look at this film, people would see it as the past. But if I reshot it so that people were really confused, like, is this past, is this present? Then as viewers, they would be doing the exact thing that I was doing, which is asking, what is the relationship between 1967 and 1997? Yeah, actually. and there were two moments in the film, the first time I saw it 10 years ago and then rewatching it this week, that signaled or gestured towards the dialectic of sex and that is when she talks about motherhood and then also when she talks about race which we, we need to address because both in the film and in Firestone's manifesto the dialectic of sex um, you almost re remove the scene where Shirley talks about her black co-workers at the post office and I just want to ask why and what would the film have been without that scene? Sure so maybe what we should say first is like, what was the dialectics of sex about? I do describe it in broad strokes uh, in the title cards at the end, but in case that like flew by, basically what she did in the dialectic of sex is try to look at Marxist theory that, you know, analyzed culture around class and, and talked about uh, the kind of class system of subjects in a way that had never really been looked at at before. And then she also was looking at how Freud analyzed uh, sexual identity. And she tried to intersect those ideas to describe what she called a sex class system or women as, as, as a class, as a, that gender is a class. And her argument, unlike a lot of what we would call cultural feminists of the time, she was a radical feminist, which basically said, I acknowledge that there are differences between men and women, essentially, which many women would want to deny because that's problematic. It could be very problematic. I mean, of course, the far right is trying to say the same thing, but that was only the first point. She was like, but that division of sex, um, and we would add of gender, has always been wielded to, towards the subjugation of women. It, it is an imbalance. So this is kind of, she does kind of a deep deconstruction of that. And it, it's really inconceivable that it came out when she was 25. So she must've been writing it when she was 24 and reading all those books. Um, what interested me, now I lost my thought, what interested me about it is that she was, she was not only thinking about that time period, but she was also making the argument in 1970 that the only way to change this is for women to be liberated from the labor of giving birth. 
So she started to think about the future, what she called, I think at the time, it wasn't cybernetics because that was more a Donna Haraway 90s thing. I forget, she envisioned a scenario where women would be able to take the process of reproduction out of their bodies and into kind of a futurist, almost cyborg state. So a lot of her propositions were very, very provocative very different than um, like Doris Lessing or Jermaine Greer or Gloria Steinem, for example. So she really was kind of considered the provocateur um, in her theories. She was eviscerated for them, although they, although they have returned, uh, they've been popularized again in like the small world of women's studies. So that was, that was kind of her core idea. What Kate's talking about, which I think is being brought up in particular because of the climate that we're in right now, is that there's one short chapter in it called Race, about racism. And what's interesting is in this moment, I think most people know at this point who think about feminism that second wave feminism from like, the late 60s, almost to the, 80, the early 80s, was, was, has been, has been, and still remains very uh, problematic in terms of their, uh, the movement's relationship to race. And I think the simplest way to describe that um, is that the word woman, that kind of, if you think of it in capitals, the word women, really ultimately was thinking about this, was defined in the same terms as the women in the movement who tended to be white women. And there was also an argument about class, although I think, I don't think it's accurate actually that all the women in the movement were um, from middle or upper middle class, I think that's actually false, but I do think that the aspirations that they were desiring in terms of economic aspirations, in terms of their professional lives, in terms of equal rights were aspirationally moving into a particular class. So that critique of what we call feminism and now we will call white feminism was uh, was was addressed then, but continued to be kind of uh, sidelined to the point that women of color, lesbian women, um, you know, queer women, still women at that point, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, all BIPOC women started creating their own collectives, which is not to say that there were no women of color in this kind of centrist feminist movement, but they were marginalized and the word women was essentialized. So in terms of my film, there is a scene, for those of you who didn't just watch it, where Shuli works at the post office and she talks about working with Negroes and um, because they were federal jobs where there was, you know, there had been recent laws changed so that uh, federal laws allowed a lot of African Americans to work in federal jobs when, the, you know, for up to that point, there was so much like kind of post Jim Crow bias and racism in hiring practices that this was kind of a new thing. So she's talking about you know, most, I, I mean, it's, it's in our terms, very racist where she's talking about, you can talk to Negroes by talking about working in the post office and she had friends, you know, her colleagues in the post office. So from her perspective, she was almost being ironic and also thinking that she was being progressive and right. talking about her colleagues and the irony that if you want to talk to a Negro, you can talk about working in the post office. So super problematic from our perspective. And so I was just like, this is too problematic. I can't put this in there. It's just like, I cannot make a film that has that language in it. And yet I created strict rules for myself and 
that extraction of a critical moment in history and a critical perspective seemed more problematic. So I did the uncomfortable thing of casting women, black women to play Negroes and had, you know, got into the post office, which, you know, would be inconceivable to get access to a post office now and went and shot that. And um, what I, First of all, I cannot imagine the film without it now. And one of the things that I noticed as soon as I started showing it was, first of all, some of the, the signifiers that could tell you that it is the now are immediately in that section. There's a, a poster that's prominently placed about sexual harassment that, would, that did not exist in 1967. Um, like I said, I would say about one quarter of audiences see the Starbucks cup that people are, um, one person is holding. But anyway, what I noticed in Shuli is it, with audiences, they're still at that point kind of confused about what the film is. And, you know, it, you know, especially when I first started showing and people were just thought it was all archival and I had done nothing. And, but at that moment where they hear her talk about Negroes, there's this kind of drop of energy in the room and both a discomfort and a little bit like, oh, okay, now we see what she's doing. Yeah, it's an absolutely visceral effect. I mean, it's like a punch in the gut to hear that, that language and also the way she objectifies her black coworkers and the way she talks about them and I just want to let viewers know that if you're interested in reading a critique of Shuli, uh, Angela Davis has written about this exact um, subject that Elizabeth and I are speaking of. And her critique of Shulamith Firestone. Yes, sorry, <laughs> Shulamith Firestone. I, I apologize. And um, Horton Spillers wrote a 1982 essay or gave a paper that was just uh, republished in the new anthology called Saturation, Race, Art, and the Circulation of Value that the New Museum at MIT recently published just in the last few months. So those are great resources if you wanna do a, a deeper dive. And the di Dialectic of Sex is actually available as a PDF online if you just Google Dialectic of Sex in PDF. So all of this is available to you. Um, but we do need to, I think, move on to some of your other projects because um, as I expected, you and I could talk for three, four hours about everything that we, <laughs> we wanted to touch on um, in this conversation. So maybe we should jump to Maria right I, now. I think that that sounds yeah. fantastic. Um, so again, we are finally um, in conversation about uh, your Maria Schneider project. And I thought maybe I should just let you explain who Maria was how you became interested in her as a subject for, um, she wasn't the subject of Sweet Ruin, but uh, a, a, a character from that Antonioni script in Sweet Ruin. Um, and what Maria Schneider 1983 is going to be at multiple stages. Okay, so Maria Schneider is, was a French actress. She at, uh, she has a very complicated uh, childhood story, um, which uh, is fascinating. But basically, her kind of public story begins in 1972, when she, after having teeny roles in films, she co-starred against uh, Marlon Brando, or with Marlon Brando, in Bernardo Bertolucci's kind of scandalous, explosive, sexually groundbreaking film, Last Tango in Paris which um, tells the story of this like burnt out uh, Brando in his late 40s, who, uh, whose wife has just killed himself, who encounters Maria, this young, sexy, irreverent, very like kind of similar to Shuli at the time, like now generation, uh, irreverent uh, young creature and proposes that they meet in this hotel, in this apartment and uh, have anonymous sex, essentially. And there's lots of other things, but what was extremely provocative about it is the kind of 
explicit, and I want to say explicit sex, but it really isn't because the only person who was naked in it was her. Brando was very uncomfortable with his body at that point. Um, and the interest in particular right now is that to be as reductive as possible is that there is one scene in the film where he rapes her and um, the what was what she said in interviews starting in the 90s and was that she had not been informed of elements of the rape scene that they, they, Bertolucci and Brando behind her back had made some ideas about how the rape scene was gonna take place that were non-consensual. So she was not physically raped in the scene. That's important, but there were elements of it that you can read about it that were extremely traumatic for her. And she was, you know, the power dynamic between a super famous Italian auteur director, Marlon Brando considered the, kind of greatest living actor at the time. And this unknown 19 year old with like no lawyer on set, no manager on set, no protection. And then of course, very different laws around uh, film production and film sets was deeply traumatized by it. And over the next 10 years went down a really kind of tragic rabbit hole of sex, uh, depression, suicide attempts and serious, serious drug addiction. She managed to pull herself together and acted till she was 58 when she died of breast cancer. But in like popular representations of her, she is described as uh, never really uh, recuperating her career from that moment. And the press, the public really eviscerated her for uh, the sexual exploitation in the film. and she was kind of forced into being um, a sex object. It turns out that actually Maria was gay. She uh, was really articulate about female representation and the misogyny of the film industry decades before um, kind of the popularization of a critique of gender and uh, bias in the industry in uh, 2017, footage resurfaced of a masterclass Bertolucci did where he acknowledges everything I just described, minus the trauma. And so, and it just took, it created a whole Twitter explosion. This was a little bit before all of the revelations of Harvey Weinstein's, but Maria basically became kind of the original Me Too. And what's kind of upsetting about it is that her, um, her articulation in public, in the press, that she had felt a little raped by it and it, she was traumatized about it, starting in the 90s, were ignored. And it only became an issue once Bertolucci acknowledged it himself. So my interest in her, uh, was probably when I was commissioned to make a film with some other artists or to make a work in response to uh, unpublished, unproduced script by Michelangelo Antonioni, which resulted in kind of speculative uh, film or film installation. And I'm not gonna go into it. This, all the films are on my website, the descriptions of them. but about a film that was supposed to be cast with Maria Schneider. And that's where I started. I mean, I'd always been interested in her, but started to do a little research in her. And uh, the film stars Gabby Hoffman playing Maria. Um, and that was in 2008. Years later, when I was starting to work on a film about an actress, and that would take like five hours to describe why I would ever make a film about an actress. Um, I started working on a blog called Who Cares About Actresses, which was kind of a, my, my place to put kind of my missionary zeal around issues of representation. My argument being that actresses are kind of the front line in female representation because we understand what a woman is essentially through representations of them. And so that actresses are usually considered kind of in decorative service to representation are 
forced to spend their lives representing uh, people that they did not write, they did not direct, they did not uh, produce, they did not edit, they did not promote, et cetera. Yes, so, the entire feminine spectrum of gender is popularly defined through actresses um, in roles that they had no control over that, that image. Yeah, but I would, I would extend it to say the kind of roles that let's say a trans woman can represent and the type of women that they present is still also highly popularized. I, I don't think we have yet to see in mainstream television, for example, a non-beautiful trans woman. I mean, I guess like Laverne Cox is who we think of in terms of a television trans star. So there's still ideas around beauty and sexuality that continue to this day. So um, yeah, so, so representation of women is problematic in terms of the idea of what is a woman. And it is problematic because none of it is written by the spectrum of what we understand women or non-binary people to be. So that was my interest. But as I started doing more and more research about her, I realized, wow, this woman is absolutely very radical because despite people describing her career as a failure because she never went on uh, only a few films and after that, she really never was in big leading roles after the 80s. She achieved something that historically had never been achieved before in a leading woman, which is that she never allowed herself to be objectified on the screen again once she got when she got over drugs. And for me, that is a profoundly radical achievement. So that, that and her life story is what interested me about her. And I was just in Paris in the winter before the pandemic started, kind of going deep into the archives. Um, what we have that we can show you right now is a one minute film that I made uh, almost as a teaser for the project right now that takes uh, material or is an interview of her from 1983 and re-edits it to kind of highlight the points that I was most interested in that she speaks about to the issues that we just talked about, but in 1983 and kind of remixes them. And we can watch that right now. Pas dédié à, au cinéma. Je suis quelqu'un qui vit avant tout. C'est des coups comme ça que tu vas te trouver. Là. Ouais. C'est un métier très très dangereux, très. On fait toujours exister une femme par rapport à un homme, par rapport à un couple. Il y a un arc de barbarie. Il y a un arc de Anyway, just to finish what the project is, the project is actually a few projects. The one that Kate and I are working on together is that I'm working with several actresses to recreate this entire seven minute interview with her from 1983 um, with different representations of an actress. So we're gonna reshoot it very faithfully. It's kind of the closest I've ever made to Shuli um, with three different actresses kind of representing different spectrums of what we understand women to be. Um, and Kate and I are talking about how to present this in a gallery so that we experience this kind of shifting time period, looking at how her words reverberate up to now in different contexts. Should I show a still? Maybe why I show a still, you can um, 
just a still of the footage, you can um, read those questions if you want. So Elizabeth shared with me some questions that she included in, I believe, a grant or fellowship proposal that I thought were um, absolutely essential to an understanding of the project. Um, and they are, how do you ethically represent a subject without being complicit in her misrepresentation? How do you dimensionalize Maria Schneider when there's so little to go on? What was the impact of trauma on her life and work? How do I handle the many contradictions in her and her friends' accounts of her life? Given that depictions of rape are primarily produced by male filmmakers, how can I represent sexual violence from a female perspective, both narratively and cinematographically? <laughs> how can I expand upon theories and approaches to biography? There you have it. Okay, so these are just a few frame grabs from the original documentary. And you can see that um, what she's talking about, well, you'll, you'll see the whole uh, short film, which is only one minute, but just to give you a sense of what, uh, what I'm interested in is kind of her prescience around issues of um, representation. She also talks about the French actress Romy Schneider, who, uh, and the fate of Romy Sch Schneider, which is a little bit tragically prescient because Maria died so young um, of cancer as well. So, yes, yeah, so those are all the questions that I'm trying to think about, not just for this short film and installation, but also for a feature speculative biography. Right. And I found a note that you gave me about recreation that I thought maybe would be a nice way to end a discussion around this. Um, you described recreation as something like an interstitial space. That's my word, but it's immediately what I, what I thought defined it. Um, the in-between of fiction and reality rather than just a filmic strategy to replace reality. And I think Maria Schneider is really going to expand upon that because I promise I will not reveal um, the specifics of the strategies you've shared with me, but you you're you have three specific ones that you're going to use and the three seven minute short films with three different um, actresses uh, will be the central documentary footage that will then be expanded upon in a feature length film that has three strategies of recreation. And it sounds it sounds complicated, but once you actually sit with that, it's just a phenomenal way of addressing this issue of history and biography and um, women identified actresses and actors who have not had that kind of, not fair, but even any type of platform or, or, or any type of um, address regarding issues of, um, exploitation and objectification. Uh, and of course, you were already working on this project before the Me Too movement, not the original. We all know that it was, a, a, it was, I think 2006 is when the first time the hashtag was used or the phrase, but yes. um, post Harvey Weinstein accus accusations and. Yeah, and I think, um, I think one of the things that is not discussed enough, although it seems both in the, you know, the beginning of the Me Too, as you said, much earlier in the millennium, and also as it became popularized in terms of the film industry, I think that trauma and the impact of women, women of color in particular, having to play roles that they have not written is profound. And so, Every time I think about like, how can I be making another film about a white actress? I think about how we can expand our understanding of the impact of trauma in relationship to representation. So yeah. I look forward to a post pandemic time when I can return to France, continue the research and shoot the film that we're really just waiting we've cast parts of it, we're just waiting to be able to make. Well, I'm looking forward to that too. And 
with presenting it at Brown when it's a fully realized 21 minute short, I believe. Yes, and I have to say yeah. in terms of our collaboration, and I know we, we have to stop right now that Kate has in our last conversation made such a brilliant suggestion about how to install this. And so it's very, it's one of the really beautiful things about a true collaboration with the curator is the kind of the, the dialogue I don't think I would have come up with that idea if we hadn't had that kind of pre-recording conversation. Thank you. Um, well, I, I really always love talking to you about this and I know we could go on, but um, thank you for making time in your busy <laughs> semester week um, to have this thank conversation. Thank you so much for having me, Kate, yeah. and thank you, Brown, for having me. Um, one of my favorite schools and many relationships with fantastic graduates of the university. Yeah, me too. And faculty, actually, and faculty. Yeah. All right. Thank you. My pleasure.